we write things down. Why? Because they're important. We want to be reminded of those things. And now I have two new things written down for this week. I have a 7 a.m. appointment tomorrow morning to have my crown installed. Do you think I wrote that down? Twice. Twice. No, three times. Because I've got in my phone, I set up an alarm to go off in the morning in case, but I never sleep in, but I'm set up. And today I have an appointment to set my alarm clock. So I'll, I always set two clocks. Emma, you're late to thinking. Chet is really off the deep end, right? But this is what I do because I'm afraid I'm going to be late. So I set up two appointments, two things, two clocks to remind me to get up. Because it's important. Why do I remember last week? Remember it was the 50th anniversary of the first time I ever taught the Bible? Why did I remember that? Because it's important. It was, it was at a time, an epic time, where things changed, things remembered. And coming up on October 10th is the anniversary of my first date with Mary Ann. I remember those things. Why? Because it's important. We write down, we remember, we do things because they're important. And God feels the same way. Did you know that? God feels the same way. There are some things that are so important, God says what? Write it down. Write it down. That's exactly what he does. He says, write it down. And he said that to Moses. He says to Moses, then the, he says to do what? Write down these words. The, you notice he uses the phrase, these words, twice. Why do you think God says these words twice? For emphasis, important. it's important. Does your doctor call you the day before or you have their computer calls you or they send you a text to remind you? Yes. Why? Because, it's in, because they want the money. No, it's because it's important. Because I was late in the going to the dentist, that left a hole in his schedule. And he can't just say, everybody else, we're going to slide you later because Chet's so important. No, it was too important. And God says, write down these words. And what are the words? That he has made a what? Covenant. A covenant. And remember what a covenant is? It's a promise. It's a contract. It's a title. Not a title like the Senior Vice President of International Marketing, which is one of the titles I had in my career, which I always, that's the best, that's the best title ever. Not that kind of title. But what is a title? It's a piece of paper that what? Guarantees. Guarantees. It's a piece of paper that what? It says ownership. Clear. Have you ever heard the expression a clear title? Yes. Yeah. What is the exp what does that mean? A clear or clean title? What's that mean? You paid for the car. You've paid for the car or the house. Or the house. No There's no complication. No liens. No liens. Is that you're leaning like this? No liens like that. L E I N, which means what? If somebody has a claim against your property has a claim against it, they actually own a piece of the rock. You remember Prudential said own a piece of the rock? You're not old enough to remember that. But it means somebody else owns a piece of it. And if you go before the courts, and a title is also a public document. A title, you can find, I actually went on uh, the internet and sought out the title of the president's personal house. Don't ask me why. I just wanted to do it to say I could do it. And I found it there. There's the title that has the land, you know, the, the, the description of it and everything, the taxes. That's all public record. A title is public. It is not private. And God says, I'm going to make this agreement, this covenant, 
this contract, and is his contract with his people public or private? It's public. Because why, and who made this contract? God made the contract. What's the difference between us and God making a contract together and God making the contract alone? What's the difference? Well, we could break ours, but God can't. We can break ours and God can't. God won't. Why not? Why won't God break his contract? Because he's taught the truth, he's just, and he keeps his word, he promises to keep his word, and he does. And he does. All those things are tied to the idea of God is always true to himself. God never, ever, never, ever goes against who he is. He never puts on a mask. He is always true to himself. And we can, we can, we can hang our hats. We can hang our lives on that. He makes this contract. And God says, he's speaking to Moses and says, I'm going to make this agreement with you. Now, part of an agreement is it takes time. So Moses was with the Lord for how long? 40 days. 40 days and 40, 40 nights. You know, it isn't like he went to the office and said, God, we're done. It's five, you know, and take the train home or whatever. It was 40 days and 40 nights. And what did he do? What did Moses do? What was his job? To write it down. This is Moses writing it down. The words of the covenant. This contract. God speaks it. Moses writes it down. What has God said to you about his promise to you? How God, remember what George just said? He said, what is the, how's God think about you? What's God think about you? In Jesus Christ, you are what? You are a new creation. You are what else? A child of God. You are loved. Never ever to be turned on. He is your Abba, God, Father, Daddy. Never to be changed. And he says those words. Which asks the question, have you ever written that down? Is there a place where you have written down what God thinks about you? And it's where you can go back to again and again and again to say, this is the truth. Wrote it down. You wrote it down? I just wrote it down on the test. You just wrote it down. <laughs> Very good. Good for you. But we need to write these down because I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever doubted that God loved you? <laughs> Have you ever doubted the fact that you're a child of God, that you're his daughter, that you're son. Have you said, have you ever thought, God, I have screwed up beyond recognition. I have just so blown it that there's no way I can be your child. You have turned your, you must have turned your back on me. Have you ever felt that way? I have. Over and over again. I heard a guy say, I wish it was my idea, is that you have a place and you gotta have a place. And you gotta have it written down in that place. So when these feelings, if you have, maybe you don't struggle with this, but if you do, it's a place you can say to yourself and the enemy, come with me. Have you ever said that to your enemy? Come with me, come with me. And you say, come in here, we're gonna sit down and we're going to look at this. What does it say? What, is, what does God's promise say about who I am? I'm a child of God. You're wrong. And I, I talk back. I talk back. You're wrong. We've got to have this. It's got to be written down. Why does it need to be written down? Do you think? Because it's important. Because it's important? Because we forget it? Forget where we wrote it or read it? There's power in declaration. Ooh, power in declaration. Like the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> There's power in it. It's a stake in the ground that says, from this point forward, 
No more. You can always come back to the stake in the ground because a relationship with God is an important thing. And it takes a bunch of things. You just don't say, oh, I got this relationship with God. That's it. No, it takes time. I mean, it takes your time invested getting to know God because we don't know God. We got to, it takes time. It takes energy. You've got to put your energy into it. Getting up and reading the Bible, studying, talking to God takes time. It takes energy. It's an investment. And it takes, you've got to separate yourself in order to do it. I'm all for group prayer. I'm all for praying in the car. I'm all for these things. But there comes a point where you just got to pull away from everyone and everything. Turn off my cell phone. Shut down the screens. Close the door. Don't listen to the dog yapping. And say, God, I need to do business with you. When I went to Mary Ann and asked her to marry me, do you think I had, we were, all, you know, there were dancers in the background, there were music, you know, I had the cell phone, there were no cell phones back then, you know, we were still writing on the walls of caves, and, you know, it was something important, and I wanted her full attention. I had never done this before, and I was like, I am going to screw this up. But it was important to get separated in order to do that. And God says, you need some time of separation with me alone. And you got to write it down. You have got to write it down. Because things you learned about God, what did we say about writing things down earlier? All those reasons? You need it. You need to be reminded. And finally, you need to make some agreements with God. God says you're his child, right? Okay. But what does that mean practically? Every day. Listen to him. Obey. He's with you. You've got to, you're going to forget those things. Trust me. There will come moments when life comes in like a flood and you're going to say, where are you? That's why you got to have it written down. That's why God said, write my word down because it's too important. To think that you're going to remember it, to think that I'm going to remember it, isn't going to happen because our memories fail. Our emotions are all over the place. It doesn't matter how we feel, what time of day it is, how old we get, whatever happens, of things leaking out of our brains. If we write it down, it doesn't change. And God says to Moses, write it down. So he writes it down. So what does Moses do? He writes it down. He writes it down. But in the process of writing it down, what happens? Something happens to it. He was not aware that he was radiant. His face became radiant. Is that because he was using Mary Kay products? No. And he had the Mary Kay glow. <laughs> Is it that he went online and bought Avon products? Because he had spoken with the Lord. Because he had spoken with God, and what was the effect on him? It made him glow. It made him glow. Yes. He also had a miracle happen. He can't live for 40 days or 40 nights without water and food. So he had to be sustained by God while he was there. He certainly was. Thank you. He experienced that, but also part of the experience is external. You spend time with God, you may not be able to walk into a dark room and be lit up, but the way people see you will change. They will say, what's different about you? They will notice the way you talk, the way you respond, the way you act, your attitudes. You see, time with God changes us. Time with God changes you. Guaranteed. I, there are very few things in this world I can guarantee. 
I can guarantee most of the time if I drop this, it's going to fall. But I guarantee you, you spend time with God in his word, you're going to change. And guess what? That'll be noticeable. You're going to change. People will see that there's a difference. Your perspective on life will change. What is important will change. Time spent with God is not a mud bath. You go into a mud bath and it does something, you wash it off, but time with God sticks. It gets into you, it changes you. And finally, your appearance. God's, his, Moses' appearance changed, your appearance will change, my appearance will change. I didn't say it's gonna roll back the hands of time. I didn't say it's Botox. Or they, they've got this stuff, I don't know what it is, this stuff that you put it on your arms or your face and the wrinkles go away. It tightens your skin. That's the good news. What's the bad news? It doesn't last. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. But time spent with God alters us in a significant way. So this has changed. And then the next step is when Aaron and they saw Moses and this radiant face, what, what was their response? They're afraid. They're afraid. Why, why do you think that, what would make them afraid? They weren't sure what was going to happen if they did come close to him. They didn't know what was going to happen? What else? Lack of understanding. Lack of understanding. It could have been, yeah, guilt. Might rub off on them. Might rub off on them. Hey, I don't know about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. They're afraid. Remember, they knew Moses from before. Right? Yeah. Did he have this glowing face? No. No. He goes up and spends time with God. He comes back. He's a different guy. If you go back to your old neighborhood and you've grown in Christ, people might say, what is different about you? That might happen. And you then have the chance to say, this is what's been going on. And he also, Moses comes and the people say something. They say, we need social distancing. Because they, they had said, we're going to stand back. We're going to keep away from you because we don't understand this. This is social distancing before there was social distancing. They said, we're going to keep away from you because we don't understand. We don't appreciate what's going on. He said, we're going to, we're going to pull away. And afterwards, the Israelites came near. They got over their fear. And what happened? He gave them what? The commandments. Which is what he wrote down. That's another reason why to write things down. Because when you write them down, you can share it. You can get you can copy, you can pass it along. Marianne's aunt, or great aunt, wrote down, she was a godly woman, and she wrote poems. And she recorded them in a notebook. That notebook went to Marianne's mother after the aunt died. And that, the words in there meant so much to her mother. They were words that got passed down. Talked about her relationship with God. The things we write down, you can pass along. You can share. You can say, this is where God has taken me. A lot of people take pictures when they go on vacation. Do you do, ever do that? you ever share those pictures? I got on a plane once, and this little old lady was carrying paper shopping bags down the aisle. And she, I'm like, 
Well, she didn't want to sit next to me. I'm like, you know, sit next to her. She stops, says, that's my seat. It's like, okay. So you get out, let her in with these bags. And she's got a big book with her. So I start, of course, I've got to talk to her. And I say, you got children? Do you have any grandchildren? I said the wrong word. <laughs> Let me yeah. tell you about my grandson. And she pulls out this big book of pictures, you know, and she starts flipping through them and pointing. And here he is, you know, when he was born, and here he is naked. And I was like, I don't want to see this. You know, and she's going through all this stuff. Here he is. Oh, and here he is in the third grade. Oh, and they did a play about Abraham. He was Abraham Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. And he recited, he memorized it, and he spoke it. And you know, it took Mr. Lincoln, he was older than 30 years old before he knew it. <laughs> you talk about what you love. You talk about who you love. You share that. You can't stop. Try it. You'll start shaking. If you someone you love, you want to share that. You're empowered. God says, you really love me? You're going to want to share it. You're going to want to live it. You're going to want to do it. And so Moses, you know, he has this experience with God. He comes down and he crawls in his hole, right? No. He seeks out community. I come from a tradition of people who went on mountaintops or went away to get away to be with God alone. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not saying they're wrong. But I think the general principle is when God reveals himself to you, when God speaks to you, what do you do? You listen and then you share it. Don't keep it in. You don't hide it under a rock. Jesus tells the principle and the story of the talents. He gives 10 talents, five talents, one talent. The guy who made 10, what did happen? He made another 10. What's God's reaction? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The guy who had five makes five more. What does God say? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy. The guy with one, what did the guy who had one talent do? He buried it. And what's God say? You foolish servant. Now, get this. This is God saying you're foolish. Not, not me. You know, not somebody on, on Facebook saying you're foolish. The, the judgment of God is you put it under a rock and you are foolish. God, Moses has this and he seeks out community. He seeks out, in essence, his small group, his group. He doesn't go into isolation. You know, with, uh, I have dear friends who, both husband and wife, I have two couples, friends of two different couples where both husband and wife got COVID. The first couple, guess what they did? They went into isolation, had to order all their food off of publics.com to get it delivered. The other couple both got it. The wife got it so bad, her oxygen level went so low that they took her and she's still in ICU. Isolation is the extreme, it's not the way we were made. We were made to be together. So when Moses finishes speaking, he puts a veil over his face. He says, for your benefit, so you don't freak out, I'm willing to change the way I live. Boy, do we need to hear this today. What is the rule of thumb about living in life, living life in America? I live the way I want to live, and guess what? 
Everybody else, hop on board. You have no right to criticize or to challenge me because I'm me. I'm the center of my universe. Moses puts, is willing to change his life for the benefit of others. There's an old fashioned word for this, it's the word deference. You ever hear of that word? Deference, what does it mean? Put others before yourself. Put others before yourself. And that's a quote. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God, how? With all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and what? Neighbors. neighbors like yourself. yourself. Don't we want to be treated special? Don't we want people to be kind to us? So what's our response? What's, how are we supposed to treat them? Like we want to be treated. In America, it's like, you know, forget you. It's all about me. But Moses did this. He was willing to change his life for the blessing of another person. Wow, how un-American is that? He saw God. He met with God. And that changed everything. Because some things with God are private. There are certain things about your relationship with God that are private. You know, we are, it's the idea of holy, which is to be this separation. It's not normal, it's not common. There are certain things about our time with God that's just between him and us. There are certain things in my time with God that are so precious that I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. There are certain things you just don't share about that time with God. Secondly, there are some things in that relationship with God where the details are just too intimate. There are certain things about our relationship with God that are private, if you will. There are those things. And third, some things are just too special for words. In Corinthians, it says to pray prayers, the Holy Spirit intercedes. Why? Because we can't come up with the words. We just groan. Do you ever groan? You ever groan before God? Just, oh God. There's things in our relationship with God that are just too special for words. So uh, whenever Moses goes into God's presence, he took the veil off. And then he would put it back on. Put it, he was willing to be flexible. He went in with God, the mask comes off. He comes out, the mask comes on. He wasn't interested in being a showboat. A show off. He was willing to do the unusual. You see, before people, we all wear a mask. We all wear a mask. All of us. Why do people wear masks in front of other people? To protect themselves? To hide what they're ashamed of? to hide what they might think about. But when we meet with God, there is no mask. We can think there's a mask. We can try to put a mask on it, but what does God see? Right he sees right through it. God sees through it all. We, so we need to drop our guard with God. You know, with people, I'm, all, I'm always on guard. There are parts of me I, I, I don't share, either because they're painful, or I've been hurt there, or there are just certain things about me I don't want anybody to know. They're really, you know, you think, what could that be? He just says everything. But there are parts 
But with God, we need to drop our guard and have this total transparency. When Adam and Eve were made by God, they were walking with God in the cool of the day, right? Was there anything between them and God? No. No. Not even clothing. They were naked before. It says they were naked before God, but there's no period there. And they were not ashamed. They sin. You know, they eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's the first thing they do? They start the clothing industry. You know, now I don't think they went down the runway, you know, I don't think Eve went down the runway saying, now Adam, what do you think? No, I don't think it was like that. But they hid, and part of the hiding was the clothing. I'm sorry? They felt ashamed. They felt ashamed. They sure did. So, where are we? George talked about how to understand and know and believe the truth about who we are. What does it say? He, this is in Colossians 2. What did God do in Jesus Christ? He did what? Canceled. He canceled, marked paid in full. What did he mark canceled? The charges against us. And what? He took it away. And then what did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. Remember the clean title? Title we yeah. talked about? Yeah. This is the title of us before God. Marked, paid in full. There are no liens. There are, there's nobody who has a call or a charge against you or me in Jesus Christ. There's a song goes these words. Kneeling in my closet, begging daily bread, there might be a skeleton hanging overhead. Where are my accusers? Where can they be found? They all dropped their stone. When the master came around, I'm clean, clean, clean before my Lord. Like a spotless lamb, I'm blameless in this sight. I'm clean. And in, in the Phillips it says, blotting out the handwritten writing of ordinance, ordinances, plural, against us. He took it out and nailed it. What this picture is, is they have these things now. You know, you used to have to, you know, growing up in Baltimore, we have a tradition. And that tradition, the steps of the houses are marble, white marble. And every Saturday I would go visit my Italian grandmother. And my job was to get the metal bucket, the scrub brush, and the comet. Okay? Put water in the bucket, go out, and scrub by hand on your knees the marble steps to keep them white, keep them clean. What's portrayed here are these things that are called scal like a scouring pads. You don't need common. You just rub it on there, and it takes it away. It's like the sandpaper that takes away the wine of the plaster. It smear, you smear the plaster on, you smooth it, and then there's no trace of it. When it says that he has blotted out, that means you can't tell it was ever there. Boy, if that isn't good news, I don't know what it is. And because of who God is and what he has done and how he has done it, we have this special relationship with God. His son, his daughter, full transparency, full freedom 
So how do we treat God in our relationship as special? Here are some ideas. First of all, the way you come before God, the way you enter into his presence. I mean, I'm all for God, Jesus being my friend, but he's also the God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. He's the one who died for me. There's a certain respect that when I come before him, secondly, we start from where we are. You don't need to go anyplace else to get something before you can go to God. You can start right where you're at. Thirdly, you can then uh, change and grow. This takes time. It takes time. Change and grow. It's a process. Next, there is a staying part of power. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I'm sure it's a distraction. There is a staying power to the presence of God to change your life. And this isn't a transparency with God, I believe is a learned and acquired skill. You can be transparent a bit, and then you get to be a little bit more, then a little bit more. Marianne and I have been married for 45 years, and I joke that we're just getting to know one another. I'm more transparent with her now than years ago, and that's the same with God. Next, we practice intimacy with God. It takes practice of learning how to bring everything up. There will be things in your life you say, God, you're not ready for this. You practice intimacy with God. You then, it changes you from within. It will change you. It will be noticeable. And finally, you got to write it down. You got to write it down. Because of all those reasons before, why did you write things down? It's important. You didn't want to forget it. You know, all those, there are good reasons why you write stuff down, right? What could be more important than your relationship with God and writing that down? Nothing. To take the time and energy to do it. And as we grow in this relationship with God, some of us have been going on with it for a while. For some of us, it's fairly new. Maybe for some of us here, it's like, should I start? The question is, it will change us into the kind of people who want to do whatever pleases the one we love. Why do I go out and pick up the dog dirt from our new puppy? Because this is some this is something that Marianne likes. It gives her pleasure. It gives her joy to have the dog. Why do I prepare? This actually takes a little bit of time. Why do I do this? To make her happy. Not this right here. I do this because I love you so desperately. I do this because I have seen Jesus Christ invade my life and change this, what's the old song say, wretched man like me. It's like, I want to please the one who loves me. It's not about what I want, it's what about pleases them. It's not a checklist. It's not like you do this and God's going to bless you. What is that? It's pride, it is what? Trying to, earn. Trying to earn. It's more selfishness. I'm sorry. If it's all about what I'm going to get, that's more selfishness. We want to obey, we want to do what God says, not just because he has wired the world and universe this way, but because he's the one who loves us. He's the one who has reached out to us. He is the one who has paid for it all. You know, the old hymn, 
talks about Jesus paid it all. What's the next line? All. all to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain, but I washed it white as snow. He washed it, he washed it white as snow. Because of who he is and what he has done, he has opened himself up to us, made it so that we can come. What wouldn't I want to do for the one person who loves me like that? Nothing. When we hear these words, I got to ask myself and you the question, who are we listening to? Am I listening to God who says that he died for me, that he has canceled the debt once and for all on the cross and rose from the dead historically and has changed me? Am I going to listen to that? Or am I going to listen to the messages that say, you got to take care of yourself. you got to watch out for yourself. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to build yourself up. Now, there's a nugget of truth in some of that. But the nugget of truth is, this is who God says I am. It isn't because of what I've done. It's because of what he has done. It's not because of who I am. It's because of who he is. So who are we listening to? Are we listening to the messages that say, this is who I am in Christ? Because there is such freedom, there is such joy, there is release of the pressure and guilt. And maybe for some, maybe there is somebody here who says, you know what, it's been a while. I've just sort of pushed God away. You know? There was a time, maybe, but you know, it's the world's been kind of harsh. Life has been hard. I gotta protect myself. Today's the day to drop the guard. God knows it all. He knows everything about you. And what's his response to you? He loves you and he is leaning into you. He is leaning out to you. He is reaching out to you. That's what grace means. The God who knows everything about me, who knows everything about you, wants to lean and is leaning. But God is a gentleman. He doesn't force his way in. He says, give me your hand. And we'll walk together. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we need desperately to listen to you. And who you say we are. Not just say who we are, but declare it because that's the truth. We are new creatures created in Christ Jesus. But the words of your word don't stop there. We are created for you and for good works. Love of God, love of you, always, always, always invades the world we live in and those around. Let us be faithful followers of you. Forgive us for our selfishness when we say, that's beneath me. It wasn't beneath you to leave the throne of heaven for us. May we live humbly before our God in a watching world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all very much. In an honor, you are loved by God and loved by me. You all have a great week. Bye bye. Struggling. Yes, I did have a problem. And that was the only. Yes, ma'am.